Good morning, all. Thanks for coming. This is what we consider to be the, 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 the foundation of um, working in the, in the Chihuahuan Desert, fencing, water distribution, moving herding, genetics, and ongoing education. We're going to skip ongoing education because, you know, we're here. It's wonderful. So let's go fencing, uh, just a comparison between before and after, yesterday and today. So at the beginning, we developed water and fence on the worst areas per ground. Uh, used traditional barbed wire fence on large areas. We ended up with large areas, over 1,000 acres. Today, we developed the water and fencing on the most productive areas. Uh, we use mostly electric fence, small areas divided by uh, type of ter terrain. We, we uh, divided by uh, if there are hills, bottoms, uh, sierra or mountain range. All that is separate. Because you leave them together, you will end it up with uh, uh, overgrazing and overresting on the same pasture. And uh, we do also do herding, meaning in, uh, uh, in the Sierra range, the mountain range, we don't do much fencing. We, we, we pretty much do herding to push the cattle to the, to the uh, hard, to, hard to get places on, on horse. We do most of the things on horse there. I mean, if you change from one paddock to the other, you can do a walk, but once you get into the mountain range, then we do it on horse. Now, why am, uh, are we saying about uh, starting on your best spots? Because it's like a, a, an investment that you're going to make. They're slightly different because on an investment, usually it's high return, high risk. Here is high return, low risk. Because that's the way we, th the way we think is, well, if I want to fix my ranch, why would I put the first fence in? On, on where, where there's already grass. But the kind of grass that you have ha can be improved in terms of the biomass, but also the quality. Because you're gonna start putting manure on, on, on the same kind of grass that you'll have, eventually will have ma uh, better nutrition. And then you will see results faster. So, someone may ask you, well, what's the deal? I mean, I already have grass there. Well, just wait. Just wait and then you will, you will be able to carry the whole cattle in your ranch on that spot, which could be a quarter of your ranch, could be, I don't know, it depends. But we first need to identify what's the best spots in our ranches. And then we start there. You forget about the rest, and then you start there, and then you'll have in your own ranch, your, like your pilot or your, your, your testing area. Obviously, I did it otherwise. I start with the worst area, I say, well, why would I work here if there's some grass? So I put the water and my fencing on the, on the worst area because I didn't want to see that bare ground. And then it didn't rain. And the best grass, I couldn't graze the best grass because I didn't have water. And then it eventually oxidized. So just based on experience. Um, this is the ranch perimeter. Probably you saw it on the presentation. These were the first pastures that we built, barbed wire. Um, we still had multiple herds. There was a lot of overresting and overgrazing on the same pasture. And that's the issue. You don't want to start with large pastures because you won't see the, any uh, very marginal results. You want to start with a, a pasture of a size of pasture that you will see results. We added more uh, permanent fence pastures. The thing he, there is, remember, we're in the desert, very limited, only uh, two or three months of rain. So we were doing rotational overgrazing. Because remember, uh, our rest periods are based on the best grass species. So if my, if my best grass species is, uh, let's say, side oats or grama grass or sprangle top, that will determine the rest. I mean, when, I, when can I graze that grass? 
when right before it sits or if it already seated, it's ready. That will, your best grasses will determine your rest period. I see a lot of overgrazing here. Now, that's the kind of electric, uh, one wire electric fence that we use. Very simple. We have, we have used the time, timeless fence, the ones that are here. With, those are pretty good too, though more expensive. Um, these are the insulators that we use. And that's how it looks like today. So I kind of tried to follow my own advice. So I put most of the fencing on what I thought would be the most productive area, which is the flat, the flat area, the flat ones. Though lately I realized that it wasn't my most productive area because I now I'm grazing the Sierra and the response is pretty amazing. And we have these cool season grasses, which I didn't even know we had them. <laughs> So, okay. Now, water distribution. That's the most costly investment we have in uh, the desert. And that has to be very well planned because many people get excited about this uh, mob grazing or adaptive grazing. They produce tons of grass and then they say, well, we need more cattle. Okay, do you have the water? No. Period. You lost your, your investment in time and so first has to be water, well planned water. Because most of us as ranchers we we do not know how to calculate flows and things like that. So it's better to get some help there. Um well in order to calculate the flow times the amount of water that you have today. Uh, you have to have some faith in terms of, okay, I will be able to increase this by X, X number of cattle. So uh, we use two-inch pipe, and we have a combination of water tanks and troughs. We have a few ponds, but as many of you know, ponds don't, get, don't work anymore when you start growing grass. I mean, you are hard. You're, you have to have a reliable water system in order for you to take advantage of every square foot in your ranch. Well, it doesn't work at least where we are because we don't have much rain, though. Now, the dynamics of the cattle going to a drink on, on a, a trough that is nearby is completely different than if you have it too far. You put much more pressure in your water system when, when the water trough is far. They go at once with a bench, big herd, and man, you, you, need, you have to have a lot of flow there. As close as possible, I would say. Uh, this is our, uh, one of our water tanks with a drinker on the outside. That's the water tanks uh, distributed across the ranch. The water tanks, we build the water tanks to be like uh, insurance. Because if for some reason the water pipe just breaks down and you have a thousand animals there, you know, I, I'm sure some of you already know that feeling. I mean, even if the water tank is, I mean, the water trough is. Uh, Thousands, I mean, they will drink it fast. So what we do is we move to the next water tank. It's like an insurance. That's the water trough that we have. And that's how the, uh, uh, between water tanks and water troughs are distributed. So we don't really, we don't have water on every paddock. We build these alleys with electric fence so they go back and forward. How often cattle is moved? Uh, we move daily, but it depends on quantity and quality. And there's no fixed time there. You have to go and observe 
and then move based on the cattle behavior and whatever you, you wanted to leave uh, as a residual. The, the important thing there is that you want to move your cows when they're full. Actually, you asked me what's the, opti the optimal, like the target. When you go and move your cows, they're laying down, ruminating, they're full, tranquil, and then you, you move them. It doesn't happen always, but that's, that's kind of nice. Mm. Now, the rest periods are also very related to the humidity, how much rain you get. I'm not saying that you have to graze once a year. It, dep it depends on the rains. You may graze twice a year, but it really depends on how much rain and the growth and everything. Now, going back to adapted cattle, for me, the less rain you get, the more important is to have the adapted cattle to your environment. Now, we're, we look a lot about uh, with the uh, coat, like the hormonal balance and also the body condition of the cow. So we select pretty much every month. Every month we take the cows out. Sometimes my neighbor complains because he said, you know, every time my father comes here, I had 500 cows and he saw 10 uh, teeny cows and he complains. I say, well, I have a, a, a my father doesn't complain. How you do it? Well, I pull those out of it, and then I show my cows, my, my father, all the other cows. So, <laughs> so we always constantly, every, every two weeks, selecting for body condition. They would put them in a big pasture. They get better, and then they are sold. We're giving them sel a selective grazing, you know? Sometimes you kind of get surprised because you go and take a look at the ones that are going to be sold. And I ask the foreman, are you sure that's the cow that was thin? <laughs> so, most of our bulls are home raised. That's a cow from uh, Tabo. We've been buying full bulls from Tabo. It's talking about good genetics. A cow from a friend of mine. Oriented cow. I mean, we're not talking about breeds. We're talking about good cows, uh, low maintenance cows. That's a good comparison between uh, low maintenance and high maintenance cow under the same conditions. The thing is, you want to have these cows because let's think about what happened when you go to a pasture. You look at the cows, and we tend to see the bad things, right? So we, we let's say that 20% of our cows are like this. So what do you do? Oh, we got to move faster, or we got to supplement. So unfortunately, these kind of cows in the herd are the ones that determine your movements and your supplementation. That's why it's very important for you to get rid of those cows. I mean, so you will have less of those, fewer of those cows. Uh, time. That's a bull from Tavos Ranch. Again, co comparison between uh, low and high maintenance. That's a good for my friend of us in Mexico too. Very good bull. Another bull. Comparison between two bulls. Well, yeah. Some pictures so you get an idea of what we're looking for. I think I showed you uh, this uh, yesterday. So we do expect the cattle to search for what they need. Once you start supplementing the cattle, then they will stop. Let's say we supplement protein, they will stop looking for protein. We supplement salt, they will, start, they will stop looking for salty plants. So we do change the behavior of the cow when we supplement. Now, the easiest part to do this is to go with a rancher, and if that rancher has that cow that eats 
something that your cows doesn't, don't, then that's what happened to me with this. My cows, my cows a few years back were not eating pre prickly pear. Then I bought some bulls from uh, Tabo, from Tabo, and his bulls were eating the, the, the prickly pear cactus. Then my bulls started eating the prickly pear. Then my cows, and now everybody loves prickly pear cactus. So that was kind of the easy, easy way for me to get that behavior into my herd. When is your turn to start eating cactus? Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's learning, right? Yeah. Um, so how we evolve? Um, yesterday we have fixed time rotations, fencing and water distribution, multiple hertz, little orientation to body condition. Today, timing is based on quality and quantity of grass and cows, fencing on the most productive areas first, one herd, everything is in one herd at the ranch, even horses, donkeys, <coughs> coyotes, no, no coyotes, no, but, um, okay. Lessons learned, uh, you'll never have such, such thing as too much water. I never heard a rancher complain about having too much water. I mean, too much water on the, on the water flow, or tanks, or troughs. Never, but I have heard many ranchers complaining about not having enough water. Uh, fencing on based on, on type of uh, range. I think we already uh, talked about that. Uh, strict selection criteria. The more often you do your selection, the better because you're, I do it uh, every other week, every other week, every other week. And let's stop fighting nature. That's what I, what I hear when I attended these uh, meetings with these um, NRCS and all these people from the government. Their presentations are always, we apply these mechanical means, we apply these chemical means, and we get into good discussions with them. And hang around with like-minded people. We were very fortunate to have these um, first practitioners of uh, holistic management. They were our mentors. And we have a group. I think Alan knows that. We travel together. We do a lot of things together. We hang out together. It's wonderful because you share great ideas. If you go with the coffee, uh, where this, um, drink coffee and think, uh, talk about rain and prices, and that's fine. But you, you, you just cannot express yourself with them. It's, it's difficult. A few pictures of other ranches in the region, different altitudes. Um, Obviously, left side is the one that is being managed. Right side is uh, communal land. Same place, other spot. Uh, right side is under uh, holistic management. Left side is continuous grazing. Another ranch. Same spot, same, same ranch. A friend of us. See the change in, in a few years. Holistic management, continuous grazing. These are different ranches. This is Tavos Ranch at the beginning, uh, three years ago. You can see the, the, the hill. And now it seems like people from universities are, uh, keep, likes to fight uh, woody plants. But they, they don't prevent grass from growing, period. Are we going to be thinking on how to get rid of some things that nature is putting there? Or are we going to be working on growing grass? 
This is my father again, sprangle top. I have seen any sprangle top plant here in California. I haven't seen one single one in New Mexico. It seems like sprangle top is the seed is there, but we have to create the conditions for it to germinate. See where the sprangle top is supposed to be. I haven't seen any here, any here, any on West Texas. So it's there. There's no reason why we should have the grass like this tall. I mean, that looks like a golf course. We strive to have the, we strive to get the cattle lost in the grass. Now, let's train our eye. This is too few cattle on large areas to oxidize. This is an area that hasn't been grazed for 10 years. These are pictures nearby my ranch on my neighbor ranch. This is a picture of uh, my ranch after a graze with a thousand animals. And this is a picture before, before we actually get into the pasture. And actually these pictures were taken on the same time frame. Oh, well, um, we're gonna show you, a, a yes sir. Oh, 10 months, 10 months, uh-huh, right, that's on the growing, the growing season. Uh, this is a video that we were asked by a, a friend of us uh, who are, who are part of our network, Regen Regeneration International. And they were going to the UN convention and they call us a week before. Do you have a video you can share? So we have a $600 budget <laughs> to make the video. So I asked my, ne my nephew, let's go to the ranch and make a video. So don't expect great things. It just, you know? Okay. Chihuahuan Desert, the largest desert of North America. Once lush grasslands supporting bison, antelope, sheep, golden eagle, and prairie dogs. Nowadays unproductive, eroded, lifeless land. There is no water on site. There is no life on site. There is no hope on sight. But there is something going on right in the middle of the desert. A few determined to green the desert to a large scale. Yes, they are the heroes of yesterday, the vaqueros or cowboys, once legendary for taming the wild. Nowadays, our best allies to get things back on track. They are working in sync with Mother Nature, moving cattle every day using fences and water points, mimicking the migratory patterns of bison decades ago. As cattle moves, they fertilize and work the soil so life can come back once rain hits the ground. This transformation is already there, even if there are islands of grass across on the vast Chihuahuan Desert. 
we can replicate these successful experiences. We can fix the water cycle. We can cool this arid environment. We can create habitat for wildlife. We can keep people on the land. We are in. We are cool. We are ranchers willing to tackle desertification. <laughs>